tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. All about nutrition from your favorite dietitian. Everything you need to digest in your mind. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Making you healthier one bite at a time. Tip with Tony. Tip with Tony. Tip with Tony. And welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. I'm very excited for you to hear from our very next guest. It is Dr. Ross, and she is going to describe everything that she does, but she specializes in helping with eating disorders and addiction. And she did a TEDx talk that I got the pleasure of watching that's incredible that I'll leave a link in the show notes that talks about how kind of trauma is often intertwined with a lot of this. So I'm super excited to get into the conversation today. So welcome, Dr. Ross. Thank you for having me, Tony. It's great you're, to be here. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. So the first question I always ask my um, guests is a three-part question. So it's to introduce yourself by sharing who you are, what you do, and most importantly, why you do what you do. Oh, my goodness. Okay. (laughs) So I'm a physician, so a medical doctor who specializes in treating eating disorders and addictions. I also did a fellowship with Andrew Weil's program in integrative medicine, so I use a lot of integrative therapies in my approach. And um, more recently, I've been doing uh, consulting work with treatment centers that want to include a um, more diverse approach or anti-racist approach in their treatments. So I'm doing that as well. I've written a number of books on food addiction, emotional eating, and binge eating. Okay, what was the second question? Why you do what you do. Okay, why I do what I do. Uh, I think from uh, a medical perspective, there's nothing that's more uh, interesting in terms of treating than eating disorders and addictions, because they do combine that body or they do affect body, mind and spirit. And so for me, it's I find it more exciting to work with people on things that are not just, you know, physical issues, but issues that have a psychological component. And then secondly, as you probably saw in my TEDx talk, I have a lot of these same problems in my own family. And so that's kind of a bit of motivating factor as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what would you say is kind of like the number one thing that you see within clients that maybe you've worked over the years that's, you know, how does the trauma translate into eating behavior? Yeah. Well, I think I can say that the majority of people that I see with eating disorders have a history of some kind of childhood trauma, uh, adolescent trauma, or early adult trauma. And I've been noticing this even before the research would support it, because in the old days, nobody wanted in medicine wanted to talk about trauma as being a contributing factor for eating disorders. It was all about, you know, the physiological things and, you know, brain rigidity and all this other stuff. But I think when you think about it, it's and, you know, it makes sense because we know from brain development that if a child is traumatized, that it affects all of the nerve connections in the brain. It, it affects the actual architecture of the brain. And that means that it that those changes in the brain then put them at higher risk for um, eating issues, for attention deficit disorder, uh, depression, anxiety, and over 40 medical conditions such as heart disease, cancer, you know, um, lung disease. And that is all from the uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences study. And I think it was a shock to medicine to realize that something like cancer risk could be increased by trauma. So we know when a child is traumatized that it's really stressful. There's a type of what we call toxic stress that occurs. And that toxic stress then makes a child or an adolescent try to cope. You have to cope some way. And so for a little person, the easiest way to cope is through food. 
Now, you know, sometimes kids will cope by acting out, and you see that a lot, particularly in, in boys. Um, but food is also another way that both boys and girls cope because it's readily available, whereas, you know, later coping mechanisms such as drugs or alcohol are not as easily available for children. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I couldn't agree with you more. What do you say, what do you say has been helpful to your clients? Is it healing like the trauma? Is it healing their relationship with food? Like what sort of process does you and your team go through to help people who are like, had trauma, but now they have to deal with the trauma, but now they also have to heal the eating disorder. Right. Yeah. I think the first thing is being aware that the eating disorder is not the problem. Mm. The eating disorder really is an attempt to solve the problem. Yeah, it's a symptom. That, yeah, it's a symptom of the problem, but it's a way that we cope mm-hmm. with the problem. And so w- w- you have to take your attention off the eating disorder, off the number on the scale, because mm. that's what you, you know everyone's been told to do. Well, everything will be great if you just lose weight or for anorexics, everything will be great if you just Gain eat. Weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, mm-hmm. so we've got to stop you know, putting our attention on the number on the scale and put our attention at a deeper level on the root cause of the problem, which is the trauma. So, you you know, you have to work uh, together on that because otherwise, if you work on the trauma, that causes that toxic stress to resurface and people then are going to want to numb it. 100%. So we have to, you know, we have mm-hmm. to give them a way to cope while they're going through working on the trauma. And by working on the trauma, I just want to clarify because a lot of people who have experienced trauma feel like, you know, feel terrified of going back into their trauma. And I'm not talking about like re-experiencing your trauma. I don't think that's something that's very helpful. It's just more triggering. Uh, But what we're talking about is having the adult perspective on the trauma rather than, you know, going back and being a victim and a little, little child. We want to have that adult perspective where we can see what happened to us and be able to cope with it from an adult point of view. And so that's part of the work. And at the same time, we want to help them have strategies to cope, you know, skills to cope with the urges and the cravings to overeat or to binge. Yeah. I, I, I would love to go into that in a second. I do want to just reiterate and address what you just said, which is so, so important where often even my clients experience this too, is as we start to actually heal their relationship with food and they're no longer using food as a coping mechanism, they often do experience more anxiety. They often do start to feel their feelings more and it becomes very uncomfortable. And often that can lead to kind of like a, what they feel like is like they're backsliding into old behaviors, but really that's progress. That's showing that you're actually getting to the root rather than putting a bandaid on things. So I think that that's um, a really good. But it can be very uncomfortable. I have so many of my patients in in my program, the anchor program who say, "I, I, I don't know what to do with all these feelings. And it sounds, may sound weird to people who have not, had a traumatic experience. But if you've had trauma, the first thing you want to do is numb yourself from the trauma. Mm -hmm. And so you numb all those feelings and you keep numbing throughout your life. So when those feelings come up, it's like a flood or someone said it was, it was like touching an electric wire, you know, the tip of an electric wire, you just feel like, you know, overwhelmed or flooded with emotion. So it takes a while to get used to feeling again. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I feel, I mean, also, and this is like a general um, statement, I guess, but I wonder what you're, if you've read any research on it, but I feel like many people, especially those who, who struggle with disordered eating or even an eating disorder, they tend to um, be fixers. And so they run from problems. And so they they never feel their feelings and their ways to cope is to just fill their plate with like all these other things. And so therefore they're just not used to feeling, they're just used yeah. to doing. Right? Yeah, literally, and, literally feel, yeah. filling their plate. Yeah. So yeah, well, I mean, I, I see a number of different archetypes, but 
for women, they're, they're often people pleasers or caretakers, mm -hmm. uh, or they can be rebels and just get angry at everything and have trouble dealing with their anger. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think those are natural responses when your voice hasn't been heard, you know, like if you, if this, if something had happened to you and people didn't listen to you or it wasn't resolved or you didn't get help with it, you would automatically default to one of these other unhealthy coping mechanisms that still make sense, like yeah. raging or, you know, numbing or, um, you know, overeating, binging. Those, those make sense in the context of someone who's experienced trauma. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you were had started talking about a little bit of how you also you're gonna you get to the root and you help them with the trauma, but you also give skills and tips to help with the emotional eating. Do you want to maybe just share a couple of those tips for our listeners today? Yeah, sure. I mean, we use um, a, the dialectical behavior therapy tips DBT. Um, they're really skills. And I want to emphasize the difference between tips and skills just because skills have to be practiced. I love that. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, people think that, okay, I try something and, oh, that didn't work for me. So this isn't going to work. But actually, you have to practice the skill over and over. And, and I want to also just say that for many of the people that I work with, they're very successful in many other areas of their lives. Yeah. And they feel like a failure in this area. So you can use some of the same skills you use to become successful in your career to help you when you're flooded with emotions. Uh, one, one set of skills are called distraction skills. So I think many of us have used this skill during the quarantine, right? Yeah. <laughs> with all the binge watching on Netflix, uh, you know, you, you work all day from home, maybe you're alone, or maybe you have kids that you're dealing with underfoot and you're just stressed. And so you go to Netflix and binge watch, you know, a series or two. Uh, so that's an example of distraction skills, but other distraction skills could be things like taking a walk or, um, you know, calling a friend or anything else that just takes your mind off of the problem for a short period of time. Another one that I really like is called push away. And the push away skill is where you imagine, or you can do it in, in real life, where you imagine yourself writing down what you're feeling and on a piece of paper, putting it in a box, and then putting the box on the highest shelf in your closet and locking it. And then you bring it down when you have a therapy session or when your friend is there that you can talk to somebody who supports you. So that's the push away skill is similar to what we use in addiction um, with addiction medicine, which is called the God box. AA calls it the God box. When And that one, you just, you make your own little box and decorate it if you want. You can uh, glam it up. And then you just, you do literally write down on a piece of paper what you're feeling, throw it in the box. You know, like, I hate my boss. He's such a blah, 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 da, da, da. Write that down, put it in the box. Don't think about it until it's appropriate to bring it out. I love that. I love the that tip of one, like putting it away, but then bringing it back out with someone who can really help you talk through it. Because yeah. if we tend to, when we like think about things and we're on our own, we all always go worst case scenario. We yeah. always like go on like sure. that, you know, um, like a spiral. It's just, yeah. it's never, it's never good. Like, yeah. Down I love the that. rabbit hole. You rabbit mean. hole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just remember though, that these are skills that need to be practiced. So if at first it, you don't succeed, keep practicing, keep practicing, and you'll find that the skills do work and they will help you to lessen the intensity of the emotions that you're feeling. And then finally, a lot of my patients also experience what we call black-white thinking. Yeah. And black and white thinking is it's either, you know, everything's either great and wonderful or it's like, horrible and worst case scenario, as you said. So when we, when we um, have been used to doing that kind of extreme thinking, we have to 
work on finding the middle ground. Yeah. And the middle ground is, you know, just, well, you know, this happened and maybe it's not the worst case scenario. Let me see what's going to, you know, it's being able to kind of accept that there is a gray area. It doesn't have to be all good or all bad or all the time or never, you know. All yeah, no, definitely. I think that that's what gets us stuck yeah. when we think it's either one way or the other way. It can be both, you yeah. know, you can acknowledge both sides and or yeah, choose like another. <laughs> yeah, like I'm really angry with my mother and I still love my mother. Mm. Or, you know, I didn't have a good relationship with my mother and I still loved her as a child. Mm. So that can be confusing for a lot of people that, you know, you care about somebody who was either maybe they themselves had um, an eating disorder or addiction or mental illness and they didn't treat you as well as they should have, but mm -hmm. you still love them or and you still love them. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, no, that's very true. That's very true. Um, so many things in my mind. One I would say is like, I want to also address maybe people listening that are relating to what we're saying in the sense that they struggle with some sort of addiction, whether it be um, food or drugs or know someone, but maybe they're, maybe they're stuck on, they did, they feel like they didn't go through trauma or maybe they're stuck on, they feel like, well, that my trauma wasn't that bad or, right. You know, yeah. So I would love for you to kind of go into kind of for those listeners who are thinking, but I've never really experienced, you know, like something so dramatic or so, yeah, yeah you know, yeah, so I, think, I, I think when we talk about when you say the word trauma, people are talking about thinking about sexual abuse or right. physical abuse or, right. you know, things like that. But there are so many other things that are traumatic, especially when you're a child, because part of what makes something traumatic has to do with how much support you have around you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even horrible things can happen, but if you have good family support, you can get through it and it helps you build resilience, but smaller things can happen. And if you don't have that support, it becomes toxic. Mm -hmm. uh, so things like bullying, people often don't think, oh, well, mm -hmm. I was bullied in school, but that's not a big deal or uh, abandonment. You know, you're one of your parents leaving you or um, dropping out of your life, uh, financial stress, you know, poverty, uh, living in dangerous neighborhoods, uh, or things like that. Those are things. That, and then also uh, race based stress has come more to the forefront. As I said, I'm doing more consulting in that area now with uh, treatment centers, and we're seeing a lot of uh, people who never had the place to really talk about the fact that they were, um, you know, discriminated against or they were um, marginalized because of their race or their color. So I think there's a lot that we have, we have to really expand the definition of trauma. And I like uh, Gabor Mate's definition where he says that trauma is the loss of an essential part of ourselves. A sense of safety, a sense of trust or vitality or security. Wow. So if anything in your earlier life made you feel insecure, unsafe, you know, dampened your vitality, like children who are emotionally abused and told that they're stupid or dumb or, you know, just imagine how that just makes your vitality go down. Mm -hmm. Um I've had patients whose coaches, whose sports coaches have told them, you're too fat to play soccer. And it's just like, really? Mm -hmm. To an eight-year-old? And, and that stayed with that person oh, yeah. into their 30s and oh, 40s, yeah. you know? Yeah, so, definitely. So you may not think, well, it was just one incident. What's the big deal? But it was a big deal because it, it did take away a sense of vitality. And she identified herself as an athlete in one case I'm thinking about. And so for her, it was like, wait a minute, but I am an athlete. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me I'm too fat to be an athlete. Right. Or you never feel good enough. That was my yeah. story. I grew up as an athlete and I was overweight and kids tease me at school. Um, and I'd get comments, you know, for even like faces made at me at the t dinner table, like my grandmother would puff her cheeks out or my dad would like make faces at me and it was all out of love and intention and their intention was pure, but it was hurtful. And so hurtful. for me being, I was, I was never good enough. No, no, nothing in my athletic performance was good enough because I was always the bigger girl on the team. 
So yeah. it was like, until I lost the weight, then I could be better. And then it limited me. It made me believe like I couldn't go. I wasn't going to, because I didn't believe in myself. I like would try, but like, I never really showed up the way that I should have because I already felt like, Oh, I'm not going to make, you know, I thought I was good enough to be on varsity as um, I was like a freshman, like when you're younger and they would pull you yeah. up and it's just, I was like, Oh, yeah, well, you know what? I'm not gonna, because I'm overweight. So, yeah, you know, exactly. so yeah, yeah no, it those, definitely those, those stories are really, really common and should be taken more seriously as a definitely, definitely. So, Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So thank you for commenting on that. Cause I think that that's important. Um, I know you have a busy day. I did want to ask kind of one, I wanted to talk about one more topic, which I know you help, you specialize in people who have drug addictions as well as food addictions. And the difference we all know is that we need to eat to live and we, you know, don't need drugs to survive. So are there parallels on, um, with how you can help, how one can help one and maybe the other, um, you know, or are they completely kind of different? Um, actually, I wrote a blog on this for Psychology Today because I oh. think there are a lot of parallels. And actually, the Yale Food Addiction Scale that we're using in research now is based on the criteria for um, drug and alcohol use disorders. And so, you know, develop the, the, I think the number one uh, on that scale is continuing to use food despite consequences. And Mm -hmm. so, and that's the same thing that happens with a substance, you know, like alcohol or cocaine or whatever, opiates, continuing to use despite consequences, whether for drugs and alcohol, it could be jail time or loss of relationships. The same thing goes for uh, people who are experiencing food addiction, that they will continue despite health consequences, you know, relationship issues and so on. So there are a number of parallels. And I think on the deepest level, the biggest parallel is that, well, there are two. One is that they all impact the dopamine reward center. So food impacts the same part of the brain that drugs and alcohol impact, and they give us that dopamine spike, and then it drops, which creates the cravings and the constant need to use again. So that's one. And then the second thing is what we're talking about, the same issues occur with people with substance use disorders in terms of the majority of them also have a history of significant trauma in childhood and early adulthood. And so, again, it's really not about the drugs. It's about the trauma. Mm -hmm. So we can talk till we're blue in the face and many people get off drugs, but they never got the trauma treated. So they still have that craving that they're fighting on a day-to-day basis. So we really have to, that's the other parallel is we have Mm -hmm. to deal with addictions on a deeper level rather than just on the superficial level of stop using. Yeah, definitely. You almost need to reinvent yourself, I feel like, and like identify as a different person. Cause if you are always carrying that part of you, I feel like it's going to be really hard to move on. You, a lot of people think that they need to drop that part of themselves or excise that or surgically remove that. I really feel that you need to embrace that part of you, mm-hmm. because we, when we embrace something that we judge and that we feel the shamed of, we bring it into the fold and integrate it into who we are, because everything that happened to, to you made you who you are today mm-hmm. for what, like you said, the bullying that you received in school and the, the things that your family did. Uh, they made you who you are today, whether it be more compassionate, more aware, you know, et cetera, more wanting to help other people. Um, So rather than trying to like put, you know, get, when am I ever going to get over this? You know, just, we have to learn to embrace the things that we like about ourselves, as well as the things that maybe make us feel bad about ourselves. Mm. And when we do that integration, then, gives us more power, more ability to fully be who we are. Yeah. I love that. There's a saying, I don't know who says it, but it's not happening to you. It's happening for you. Yeah, that's true. I think it's powerful and it helps you shift your perspective on things and 
Yeah, yeah. I think that's really awesome. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's really hard to adapt to that way of thinking. I mean, even for myself, you know, if I don't get a contract that I've gone after, I think, ah, oh, you know, what's what's wrong? Why didn't I get that? And then I remind myself, well, if it was, if I didn't get it, it wasn't for me. Right. And so I'm going to wait. Something better is coming. Yeah. You know, or I'm going to wait for whatever is coming. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing I can do to make people, you know, do what I want them to do, Absolutely. which is really tragic. I, I feel like the world would be a much better place if people followed my instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got you there. You uh, thought I was serious, didn't you? <laughs> it's so funny. No, it's so funny. But you are very knowledgeable and you definitely provide value to so many. So I, I think people yeah. should, you know, definitely, you know, take you more seriously, um, you know, with situations like that. But anyways, um, tell people where they can find you. Um, you know, you have a lot of different books. Like what, do you have a favorite book? I know that's probably hard. I'm, I'm currently, I'm about to release a book. I feel like my favorite book will always be this book. Cause I don't know if I'll ever write one again after, but it's very hard. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> yeah. I, I um, swore I would never write one after my last. That's one. what I keep saying. And, and my, my book <laughs> editor is like, okay, Tony, like, let's just finish this one. But like, sure. Okay. Sure. Well, first of all, we have a book sweepstakes going oh. on. It's a, uh, raffling off a free copy of the food addiction recovery workbook. I love so that. If, yeah, if people go to the website, it's Carolyn Ross MD.com. Okay, I'll C- put that in the C- link. Ross MD.com. And you know, that's a good place to see, see other things that I'm doing. There are videos, there's also the TEDx talk. So that's good. On, um, it's on that website as well. So good. So, so good. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to add before you wrap up today? Yeah, I would just like to encourage people to continue to look for help because when you find the right thing for you, it really transforms your life. Yeah. And that's really why I, you asked me why I got into this work. And some people say to me, well, but it's so hard. And so many people are, you know, don't do well and all of that. But what keeps me going in this work is that I see people change and transform yeah. their lives. And that's really amazing for me. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so yeah. awesome. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being here. Guys, I will put all of her links in the show notes. So make sure you give her a follow. Um, go check out what she has to offer. And um, if you enjoyed this episode, take a screenshot of it, share it on your story and tag me at tips underscore with underscore Tony with an I. Um, let us know what your big takeaways were. And if you feel like someone you know would benefit from listening to this, send them a message. I think that's super important. We want to get this message out to as many people as we possibly can. So thank you so much for listening. As always, I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. 